So now I get to talk officially, not just ask questions. Um, I'd like to start my talk uh, by saying thank you to the people that were involved in this project, right? Normally people do it at the end, but it's something that I'd like to do at the beginning. Uh, this is a project that I started about uh, 10 years ago because functional imaging in the uh, macaque monkeys, uh, in vivo studies, it started to experience a, a really big hype and, and we could do things with the macaque monkey that in the past could only have been done with, with humans. And what I wanted to do was create a, you know, a three-dimensional model of, of the macaque monkey brain. Uh, I, I don't really need three dimensions for my work because anatomists, we have to, to, to we work with post-mortem brains. We, we have to train and, and learn to see things in two dimensions. But if you want to compare this kind of data with uh, in vivo studies, then you need the three dimensions. And in, in my case, because receptors for classical neurotransmitters are at the center of, of my research and receptors and neurotransmitters, they are the structures that bridge or they are the brain elements that, that bridge structure and function, right? They are the elements that enable communication between cells. So if you want to correlate structure and function, well, neurotransmitters and, and their receptors, they bridge this gap and, and it, it is then important to bring them into 3D. Um, if you want to know a, a brain, if you really want to understand the system, you don't just want to say, oh, well, you know, there, there, there are differences here and there's, you know, there are more cells here or more myelin fibers there or whatever. You want to actually know how this can be broken down into different structures. Because when you're in the brain, it's just the same as when you're in the world. Location does matter. It's important to know if you are living in, you know, a certain state uh, in the United States or in another one because there are different rules that apply even to different states within uh, the United States. You can be legally married in one state and not legally married in another one. Uh, if you want to travel from one country to another country, you have to know where it is you're traveling to in order to know what kind of clothes to pack. So for example, when I packed my case to go to Zada uh, last year to the Big Brain meeting, I had you know, much lighter weight stuff than what I had to pack to come uh, here for this meeting, right? So to, it's, it's not just uh, important to provide a three-dimensional model of, of a brain, as far as I'm concerned. It's important to also provide a map uh, depicting the number of structurally distinct regions that you can define within this brain, okay? So here you see uh, the team um, of people that have been, that have been working on, on this multimodal architectonic mapping. So Luthia, Nechi, and uh, Sonia, they were, well, Sonia still is a PhD student of mine, and Lucia and Mechi are now uh, postdocs. Um, Javad is also a postdoc who was in, in my team, and Daniel and Isabel were PhD students that came to visit, do part of their PhD uh, in my group. Um, Thomas, you met earlier on. The work that he did uh, as, a, as a postdoc in, in my group basically resulted in the pipeline that he presented in his talk earlier on and the, the images that he used for his reconstruction were, were created uh, in, in the receptor group. And um, I've also been involved in the development of a, a multimodal population-based uh, ba population uh, template. This is actually work that's been carried out in uh, the lab of Wim van Duffel, uh, um, and, and she was heavily involved in, in that part of, of the work. I was, I was only a, a, an anatomical advisor, so to speak. Um, and then, of course, we need to present all of this uh, work to, to the world, so we need a, a viewer. And uh, Chao from Timo's group was, um, well, basically he wasn't heavily involved in it, he did it. Um, he was still smiling before he started the work. Um, my next project, I still don't have a, a person that I can put a photograph of there, is to also, it might be Justine, 
but we'll have to talk about this, is, is to not just present the data in a viewer so that people can see these parcellations and so on, but um, also that they can upload their data, you know, their in vivo data, upload pet data that's being acquired now also in, in macaque monkeys and, and do actual analysis with that. So that is my, my outlook of, for, 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 for this project of mine. Um, so Michi presented a, a bit of the pipeline of, of, of what we have to do to acquire this kind of data. This is really, really time consuming and even more expensive. Uh, we have to cryosection the brains. That means that the tissue that we need to, to visualize receptors, you can't uh, use a chemically fixed uh, brain. It has to be deep frozen. This means that it's, that it's technically more challenging to section than um, uh, fixed brains. We use uh, 20 micrometer sections uh, because it's not fixed. These sections, they actually, when you thaw mount them onto the glass slide, they, they collapse in, into each other. So, so if you acquired set sectioning or set images uh, through these histological sections, you, you wouldn't have a 20 micrometer thick um, section. Uh, although, you know, microtomes, cryomicrotomes are high precision in instruments, we set the section thickness at 20. Maybe the section thickness is only 19 or 21, uh, but, but as I said, thaw mounting, it will, it will collapse. So it's less than 20 sections. What we do is at a certain rostral cord level, and that's what's shown by the... Um, by this group of sections here and this line here, we acquire a series of sections which are processed then for um, cell bodies, myelin, and for the visualization of different receptor types, right? So this is a block of, say, 15 sections. And we repeat these blocks of sections throughout the entire brain to be able to acquire this kind of data. Um, the experiments um, to visualize the receptors uh, mean that we have to incubate each one of the sections with a radio-labeled ligand that specifically binds to the receptor that we want to analyze. So we've got a first step, which is a washing step. We just want to get rid of the endogenous substances that are in the brain, so chemical substances that are still in the brain tissue and that could bind to the receptor that we want to visualize and, and uh, basically um, block the binding sites. We then have a, a so-called main incubation, which has two different parts. As you can see here, part of the sections are incubated with only the radio-labeled ligand, and a few sections are incubated in a solution with the radio-labeled ligand in the same concentration as this solution here, but to which we have added a so-called displacer, which is present at a higher density, or concentration, sorry, and which also binds to the receptor with a higher um, affinity. And this is because for technical reasons, it's not always possible to produce a radio-labeled ligand that um, binds with a 100% specificity to the receptor that you want to analyze, okay? And that's why you need these blue dots. That's why you need these displacer substances. So they block the so-called uh, non, uh, or they, they, they block the, the specific binding sites. And the only thing that's left afterwards is the non-specific binding. I'll show you a, an image of that in a second. And then we've got a rinsing step, which just, you know, uh, stops the binding procedure. Once you expose these radio label sections against uh, tritium sensitive films, you get an image like this, okay? Now up here, what you see in this um, uh, image, it's uh, coronal sections through a macaque monkey brain and they've been processed for the visualization of kinate receptors. And um, on the top, you've got sections which were incubated here for the visualization of the total binding and if you look very carefully at the bottom here, you will see something which you might think are ghost images, right, of, of, of sections here. Now that, those are the so-called non-specific binding 
um, images. They are the ones resulting from incubation of the sex sections in this buffer solution here, okay? The paler these images here are, the more specific this binding is here. And we can then just measure the gray values here and the gray values here, subtract it when you, when you measure the gray values in the same anatomic location. You can subtract the gray uh, values from each other. And we know that, that with the um, binding uh, protocols that we have, this non-specific binding is 5% uh, or less than the total binding. So that's why we consider that our total binding experiments are the equivalent of the um, specific binding. Um, these, these films, the, these are, uh, well, they're basically like plastic films with an emulsion on them. I don't know those of you that, that know the old-fashioned X-ray films, that's what they look like. So if we want to analyze them, we have to digitize these images. That's what's happening here. We've got a light, light source of homogeneous light. Here, we've got the film with autoradiographs on it. We've got a digital camera. We've got a, 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 an analysis um, system. And um, on the film here, I also show these little squares. They are standards with known concentrations of radioactivity. So we co-expose these against each one of the films, right? And then once we've digitized the images, we can measure the gray values in each one of these standards. We know what their um, um, radioactivity concentration is. We've calibrated them for, for brain tissue content. So then we can create a calibration curve. And then afterwards, we can um, interpolate the gray value from each pixel in an autoradiograph into this curve here to transform that gray value into a concentration of radioactivity. And then just for visualization purposes, we can then color code these, these images of these sections, and that's how you get the, the color coded images that I'll be showing you in a second. So what you see here are um, several sections through a macaque monkey hemisphere, and they've been processed for the visualization of the alpha-1 receptors for noradrenaline. So this section here is very far rostral, the frontal pole. We're moving back into the, the occipital pole. Um, red colors co code or red, orange colors code for high receptor densities. Blue tones code for low receptor densities. And here in the, the cutout, it's, it's, it comes from, from somewhere, you know, around here. It's, uh, there's, there's an image of the thalamus. And um, we've identified a whole load of areas um, throughout the brain. I'm not going to go into any detail about that uh, today because I think you've heard about it probably in, in, in um, other talks and other highball meetings. And I must confess that I thought that Meiji was going to be uh, mentioning more about this uh, uh, observer-independent method. But it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's very um, technical and, and, and time-consuming. But what, you, what, what I just want, the take-home message that I want you to have is that these lines that we've got here identifying borders between cortical areas, they weren't just uh, drawn there because an anatomist sat down and said, well, look, I think that, uh, you know, there's a difference in the, the, um, the cell body distribution, the alpha-1 receptor distribution, the AMPA receptor distribution or whatever at, at, at this point or at this point, and, 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 and that's how these different areas are, have been defined. It's the fact that all of these cortical areas here, we have uh, validated their position with a statistically testable method. And that's what um, makes this approach also um, quite, uh, well, reproducible and um, I, I think quite uh, robust. Um, now all of this work has up to now, could, could we start the video please? Thank you. So, so the result of this, of this work is that up to now we've already mapped and published uh, 94 cortical areas which cover the entire frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, um, and the occipital lobe. We've got a total of 76 um, subcortical nuclei. Those of the thalamus have already been published. Those for the amygdala, the um, publication 
I'm working on it. Um, and here you can also see the, let's wait for it to turn, the cingulate cortex. The cingulate cortex is going to appear here. This is, this is work in progress. Um, Lucia has identified a total of, of 26 areas and she's currently writing the manuscript. We're working on the auditory cortex, the hippocampus, the insula, temporal parietal junction, junction and, and basal ganglia. So I hope that maybe in Thomas was so, you know, uh, positive and said next year he'll be presenting whatever it is. Uh, I, I hope in five years then to be able to present a complete map of, of the macaque monkey um, brain. The 3D reconstruction part, uh, basically I, I, well, I asked I, I searched for somebody who could do a 3D reconstruction because there are some questions that, that, that can't be um, answered just by looking at, uh, at, at two dimension sections. These are, um, this is very, very, very time consuming work uh, uh, um, uh, collecting this data and I wanted also to be able to have uh, three dimensional volumes in which I, can, I, could, I could answer I, or I could ask a, a series of questions um, at, at a, a voxel-based um, level, and, and that's why Thomas has created this reconstruction um, or, or, you know, working on this. So, so now, finally, I've, I've got a 3D reconstruction that I can play with and I can start uh, answering some of the questions that, I, that I've been asking myself over the years when I've been looking at the, at the two-dimensional sections. The nice thing about the work or, or the pipeline that Thomas created was that um, by reconstructing the um, receptor autoradiographs, and what you see here is basically the same uh, reconstruction as in the previous slide, only it's got a different color coding, but because um, the brains were serially sectioned because I don't just have, you know, the different receptor autoradiographs, but also the myelin and the cell body stain sections. Um, Thomas could also create 3D reconstructions of these myelin and, and cell body stains. So that's why we can then um, integrate and really look you know, in the same individual. This is also another thing that's really important, right? What is the relationship between the laminar distribution pattern of uh, cell bodies, which is what you can see with the cell, uh, with the, with the, with the staining here, uh, the myelin fibers that you've got in the cortex, which is what you could see here, and then the distribution patterns of um, receptors. And if you really want to have the ground truth, you'd have to look at this in specimens from the same individual. And this is something that I'll be able to do, or that I have been doing in 2D, but will be able to do in, in 3D now. Now, moving on to the development of the macaque multimodal population-based template, well, some people can ask, why on earth create another template? There are already loads of uh, macaque monkey templates out there, and that's true. Um, they are out there, um, but and I'm 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 I've almost finished. Um, Vim wanted to do this because these monkeys are still alive, so we can acquire. Uh, well, he's acquired loads of functional data from these monkeys, and we can acquire more data. So, so this is really valuable to have live monkeys with, with, with high quality imaging data. And, and in the framework of the Human Brain Project, we created this uh, MeBrain's multimodal template. It actually gives us, when you compare the, the, the MeBrain's template, which you can see up here, if you compare it with other existing templates, um, it, it provides a really high quality data set. It's already multimodal because it's based on T1 and um, T2 sequences, and we've used this template here to anchor our maps in the uh, uh, MeBrain's um, multi-level macaque brain atlas. And this is the work then that, that Xiao was involved in. And uh, here you see a couple of examples of, of, of sections, how you can already query the data, find here, find the, the maps, the parcellations that we've already published, the receptor data that's associated with it. We don't just have a volumetric data set, we also have surface-based, um, because Vim comes from 
um, the, the visual world and in the visual world functional we've got uh, retinot retinotopy maps which are in 2D and of course you know surface maps are, are, are also in the future and with this I'd like to finish um, and thank you for your attention sorry for over speaking <laughs> <laughs>